and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss clinical topic in gastroenterology. My name is Francesca Moroni, I'm one of the gastroenterology consultants in the north of Scotland. Today we are discussing pancreatic cysts, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Lynn Smith, a consultant gastroenterologist at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Hi. Thanks, Francesca. I'm delighted to be involved. Thank you for asking me. Well, I must admit, when it comes to pancreatic cysts, I'm rather ignorant. I seem, seem to stumble across them in cross-sectional images, and then I always have to remind myself about guidelines or even ask an expert like yourself. So is there an easy way to classify pancreatic cysts? Yep. Um, yeah, no, so it, it, you're quite right, Francesca. So pancreatic cysts are usually found incidentally. And the incidence is increasing. So that's partly because we scan people a lot more than we used to, and the quality of our scans and images is improving as time goes on. So the um, prevalence of cysts is about 2.5%, believe it or not, in asymptomatic individuals. Um, the incidence increases with age as well. So for example, to give you a rough idea, if you were to scan everybody over the age of 70, about one in 10 people would have a pancreatic cyst. Now, the majority of these cysts are small, so the average size of cyst is less than one centimetre in size. But, but you're right, they, they are common, and we're all going to see them, including our general uh, medical physicians. So in terms of classifying cysts, so there are lots of different types of, of cysts. Um, if you ask somebody to name you a pancreatic cyst, most people come up with pseudocyst. It's actually not the most common. So how can we classify them? The first broad way of classifying cysts is into neoplastic and non-neoplastic. So non-neoplastic, that is things like your pseudocyst and a simple retention cyst. So usually we do nothing with those unless they're symptomatic and they don't have a risk of malignant progression. Your neoplastic cysts, um, these are the ones that we do get a bit more interested in. Neoplastic cysts are split into mucinous cysts and non-mucinous cysts. So I'll briefly mention the non-mucinous neoplastic cysts first. The most common one in that group is the serous cyst adenoma. So they are relatively common, but they have no malignant potential, so we don't follow them up. Now, sometimes it can be difficult for us to tell the difference between an SCA, a serous cyst adenoma, and some of the other mucinous lesions. Um, so that, that's why I mention it. So then the mucinous Neoplastic cysts, these are the ones actually that, that we're interested in, that I'm interested in in particular. There are two types of mucinous pancreatic cysts. The most common is one called an IPMN. So that stands for Introductal Papillary Mucinous Neoplasm. Um, within that, they are subdivided again into main duct IPMN and branch duct IPMN. So a main duct IPMN is basically a dilatation of the main pancreatic duct. They have quite a high risk of malignancy. And in previous series of all the main duct IPMNs that you resect, about 60% of them will have malignancy within them. Then you've got your branch duct IPMN. They uh, tend to look on imaging a little bit like a bunch of grapes. So it tends to be like a cluster of cysts. And there's usually a connection that you can see on MRI or sometimes EUS with the, the undilated pancreatic duct. So that's a branch duct IP main. You can, to confuse things further, get a mixed type as well where they've got characteristics of both. So those are your IPMNs, they affect males and females. Um, about 20 to 40% of patients with IPMN will have more than one as well, and that, that can help us with the diagnosis. If you see somebody with several cysts, it's probably going to be an IPMN. And as I said, although they all have malignant potential, it's actually the main duct ones that have a higher uh, malignant potential than the branch duct, and so that can influence how we manage them and whether we survey them. Uh, the other type of mucinous neoplastic cyst that we see a lot and we are interested in is an MCN. So that stands for mucinous cystic neoplasm. So these are 95 to 100% female, usually always in the tail of pancreas. And unlike IPMNs, they have a uniform uh, malignant potential. So it doesn't matter on the size or the rate of growth of this cyst, um, we recommend resection and the, the consensus guidelines recommend consent um, resection of these cysts assuming the patient is fit. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of the different types of pancreatic cyst. Great. It seems fundamental that we try to identify which one are the cysts with malignant potentials. So is there a way using images that we can do that? Yeah, imaging, <coughs> definitely very helpful. First thing I would say, ultrasound, pretty useless for imaging the pancreas gland. You know, the, the 
transverse colons in the way. What you really need is good quality cross-sectional imaging. So either a dedicated CT scan of pancreas or ideally an MRI scan of pancreas with MRCP images. A couple of um, advantages of the MRI over CT. First of all, obviously MRI doesn't um, have a radiation exposure to the patient. Um, so particularly in patients that might need ongoing surveillance of these lesions, MRI is a big advantage. The other advantage of doing an MRI pancreas with MRCP images is um, the MRCP images can sometimes demonstrate a connection between the cystic lesion and the pancreatic duct. Now that's really useful if we are trying to tell the difference between a branch duct IPMN, so if you remember that's the mucinous one that we want to follow up, versus a serous cyst adenoma. Because sometimes they can look very similar, as, and as I said before, the serous cyst adenoma, actually you can reassure the patient, we don't do anything about that. The serous cyst adenoma does not have any connection with the pancreatic duct, whereas a branch duct IPMN does. So MRCP images can be really useful for helping us to, to tell the difference and to risk stratify. You can see other um, classical findings with uh, certain cysts. For example, a serous cyst adenoma will sometimes have a little central scar on MRI scan. So again, if we see that, we can rest assured, OK, well, that's almost certainly an SCA and reassure the patient accordingly. And generally, they don't need any further follow up. In terms of other imaging, obviously you might have heard of endoscopic ultrasound. That's an invasive way of ultrasounding the pancreas gland that's generally only done in um, tertiary referral centres. Um, the advantages of EUS are you're up close to the pancreas. Um, again, you can sometimes demonstrate communication between cystic lesions and the pancreatic duct. But also EUS can enable you to take um, samples um, from the, the, the pancreatic cyst, so aspirate cyst fluid, for example. So interesting that you mentioned that. Is it necessary to aspire for cytology or histology in this cyst? So not in everybody is the quick answer to that. So no, not everybody needs an EUS. We tend to reserve EUS for patients um, who potentially have cysts that are worrying us. So per perhaps if we're trying to risk stratify them further to see if they need surgery or so on. Or if there is a wee bit of dubiety, so as I mentioned before, sometimes it could be very difficult to tell the difference between a branch duct IPMN and a serous cyst adenoma, so a mucinous and a non-mucinous. So we can perform a US. It is a wee bit user dependent, but you know we can perform a US and we can look for a connection with the, the branch duct. We can look for nodules. We can give contrast during an EUS, a type of contrast called sonoview, um, which can sometimes let us know if there's any enhancement of nodules, of cyst walls, of septations. These are all things that would help us risk stratify the lesion. And then we can um, aspirate the cyst. So what do we look for if we aspirate the cyst? We can send it for cytology. So Sometimes you might see you know, malignant cells, um, but more commonly what cytology can be useful for is, is there mucin or is there not? So if we see mucin on cytological smears, then, then fantastic, you've, you've got your diagnosis, you know this is a mucinous cyst that needs some sort of follow-up or intervention. The other things we can send fluid for is biochemical analysis. So we send it for CEA and also for amylase. So CEA tends to be elevated in mucinous lesions, so cut off of around about 192, um, whereas amylase would be super high in something like a pseudocyst and a, and a bit lower, but not necessarily negative in a, in a mucinous lesion. There's not one good test um, through EUS or through any imaging that can always give you a definitive answer. So it tends to need a lot of these things together um, and then discussion at the MDT. In terms of future prospects and, and, and stuff that happens now during trials, you can do um, molecular analysis of cis fluid as well, um, looking for something called um, KRAS or GNAS. Um, but again, this is not in, in wide use, but it's another way of trying to tell the difference between mucinous and non-mucinous cysts. Among the mucinous cysts, you mentioned IPMN, which are the ones that we need to follow up. And what are the you know, high-risk features we should be concerned about and who should we survey? Yep, so very good <coughs> question. So there are several guidelines out there for how to deal with IPMNs in particular. Um, if we think of um, muc all the mucinous cysts, there's a lot less debate about mucinous cyst neoplasms. You know, it's quite straightforward if the patient is fit, you resect them. IPMNs has always been a bit more debate. In terms of what guidelines are out there, we've got the International Consensus Guidelines. There are American guidelines, the AGA um, published guidelines in 2015, and there also are some European guidelines. 
The ones that are probably most widely followed um, are the international consensus guidelines and certainly those are the guidelines that we follow in the west of Scotland. The guidelines and and the role of surveillance has changed over the last 10 years or so and if you go back um, to uh, the last 10 years or so, um, we used to resect a lot more cysts than we probably do now. And in some ways that's great because you're preventing pancreatic cancer, but we were resecting an awful lot of benign disease. And you have to remember that in any of these um, decisions about pancreatic cysts, we're always trying to balance preventing pancreatic cancer versus the risks of pancreatic surgery. We don't have another way of treating pancreatic cysts at the moment um, that's proven apart from resection. So we have to put a patient through either a Whipple operation, if it's the head of pancreas, or a distal pancreatectomy if we think they've got a high-risk cyst. And both of those operations are major operations with significant risk of morbidity and unfortunately mortality associated with them. So if we um, concentrate more on the international consensus guidelines, because those are the ones that um, I say are most widely adopted, When we're looking at the um, presumed IPMNs, the first um, uh, things that we want to look for are something called high-risk stigmata. So um, you'll see these on a slide, but the high-risk stigmata that uh, we we want to be aware of are a cyst in the pancreatic head causing jaundice, for example, a main pancreatic duct greater than 10 millimetres in size, an enhancing um, mural nodule, more than five millimetres in size. So if your patient has any of these high-risk stigmata, then they should be going straight for resection. So that again, that's a decision that's made by the pancreatic MDT, but we don't worry about repeat scans, we don't worry about EUS. If they've got these criteria and they're fit, then, then we'd be taking them straight for resection. Then your second group of patients that we want to be aware of are patients with worrisome features. Uh, So again, you can see this um, in the slide, but uh, examples of worrisome features in cysts are a cyst size greater than 3 centimetres, a main duct between 5 and 9 millimetres, an enhancing mural nodule that's less than 5 millimetres, Um, enhancing or thickened cyst walls, um, a a rapid cyst growth over a several year period. So these are some of the examples of uh, what we call worrisome features. So if a cyst has worrisome features either on initial presentation or during follow-up, then we would tend to move to EUS at that point and, and discuss at the MDT. So then the rest of your IPMNs, so these tend to be the cysts that are less than three centimetres in size, who have no high-risk stigmata or worrisome features, then they enter into a surveillance programme. So surveillance is stratified dependent on um, cyst size. So for example, if you had a a cyst that was less than a centimetre, I might only be um, suggesting surveillance every two years, for example. Um, In terms of cessation of surveillance. That is uh, an interesting and debatable topic. The AGA guidelines, those are the American ones that I mentioned earlier, um, they suggest stopping surveillance after five years if somebody has a cyst that is static. Now that has not been widely adopted by most units and there is a bit of controversy behind it. One of the main reasons for that is we know that although these IPMNs themselves have a pre-malignant risk or a malignant potential, in fact, patients with IPMNs have an increased risk of de novo PDAC, so de novo pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So um, that's why we get a wee bit worried about potentially stopping after five years just because their cyst hasn't grown because we know that this subgroup of patients have an increased risk of overall pancreatic cancer, even if it's not from that one cyst. Within actually that group, it might be worth saying at this point, um, in patients with IPMNs with a family history of pancreatic cancer, they're at an even higher risk again. So when we're deciding surveillance, if we if we know a patient's got a family history of PDAC, then we might be um, performing their surveillance scans a bit more frequently. You mentioned about the MDT, and I'm aware that the West of Scotland has led by yourself a pancreatic service. Could you tell us how that works and what's your recommendation to the general gastroenterologist that wants to refer a patient to your service? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're right, so we um, have our West of Scotland pancreatic unit. So we serve the health boards of Esher and Arran, Lanarkshire and all of Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So um, we receive referrals about pancreatic cysts um, in from all of those areas and quite a lot, as you can imagine. 
Our guidelines are pretty much based on the international consensus guidelines. Um, so as I said, we um, when we get the initial referral in, you know, um, if they've got any high risk um, stigmata or worrisome features, then as you know, they, they, they go down that pathway, but otherwise then they'll, 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 they'll come on to surveillance. So when a patient first gets referred in, assuming they're fit for surveillance, so that means assuming they're fit for potential pancreatic resection, then they're entered into our database. The patient gets sent a letter sort of with a brief description of what the service is, and they get offered an opt-in appointment at one of my clinics, which can either be face-to-face or um, telephone um, or video. To be honest, actually, most of them um, don't, don't, don't use the opportunity for an opt-in clinic, but I think a lot of the times that's because the referring consultant might have already had a bit of a chat with them, which is useful, but it's a service that's available to them. A letter gets sent to the GP, just updating them about the, the service, and then the referring doctor is asked to request another scan in six months' time. So that is regardless of the initial size of the cyst, we ask for a repeat MRI or CT scan in six months' time. And that's to give us an idea of the initial rate of growth of the cyst so we can help risk stratify them from then on. After that six months, they're reviewed by myself in one of our virtual non-attendance pancreatic cyst clinics. So I run these once a month when I review the images and and the report and the patient's notes. And from then, we make a decision about when their next scan's going to be or do I need to um, sidetrack them into the MDT for discussion or do I need to organise an EUS, obviously depending on what their repeat scan shows. And then that's all communicated back to the referring um, consultant and to the patient. From then on, I take full responsibility for organising all their follow-up scans. Um, So uh, uh, from the point of view of the initial referring doctor, yes, I I do ask them to organise the initial scan, but after that, um, it's all led through the pancreatic unit. Seems a very well-run service, and I compliment yourself for running all these referrals by your own. Thank you. Um, What would be your top tips to the general gastroenterologist that comes across a pancreatic cyst lesion, how to best manage the patient and also you know, when it's time to refer it to you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, top tips are are summary. As we said, pancreatic cysts, very common, um, increasing in incidence, so you are going to come across them. Um, In general, we do want to know about them, assuming the patient is is going to be fit um, for any sort of surveillance. What should you tell the patient? um, And and I didn't really give you any figures, and I suppose now would be a good time to do that. Um, If you come across one of the you know, the probable branch duct IPMNs, and as I said, most of these are less than a centimetre. A good rough figure that you could quote to your patient if they're looking for one is, you know, these small lesions without any worrisome features or high-risk stigmata probably only have about a 2% risk of malignant potential over sort of five to 10 years. So although, yes, we're saying there's malignant potential, it, it is small. Um, when you are referring the patient to us, it's really useful from, from my perspective and from my colleague's perspective to have a, an idea of their past medical history and their performance status and, and of course, their medications as well because that sort of helps us, helps us move forward. Um, but, but overall, we're always happy to take referrals. If in doubt, refer it in um, and we'll let you know if, if we think that they don't need any further follow-up. Well, thank you. I certainly learn a lot today, so the only things that's left for me to say is to thank you for an excellent run through this very relevant topic. Okay, thank you very much. And to thank you for joining us for Digest This.